system and School of the Arts that have our dish, uh, entry criteria that, yes, in fact, they, they have to be done with their process before the lottery kicks in. This sort of comes sure. okay. to something I was thinking of today is what we haven't done, which would be good to do, is do a process map of the process of somebody calls to the placement office or contacts the placement office, then what happens? That's a great idea. Walk it through. Yeah, you walk it through. So you need to do that or somebody needs to do that. I could do it with the people who actually do the work. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the theoretical map. Yeah. Well, it's the actual the people map. map. We know what we actually do. We know what's supposed to happen. Right. So I can tell you what's supposed to happen. <laughs> this is what I really do. Yeah, and, that's a really good idea. and it's better. So it would probably take a few people out of the placement office for probably a couple hours, a couple different times maybe, mm -hmm. to go through all the sticky notes. And, and different um, parent representatives, right? Well this is the one from the inside of here's what happens, here's what we think we happen when we answer the phone. Mm -hmm. First it actually does happen. Right. And then the parents can either say it's validated or not validated. Uh, and it's different for different grade levels, too. I've talked to them about that. And I've also, I mean, both in terms of being a parent with a problem and just asking them what is the process generally. And I think that, first of all, what happens when you call is not consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that. I mean, I think we, we already know that there's a problem there, but we should probably focus on how can we make it clearer? Like, how can we... Um, I think we looked at the flow chart, and you could say, this step here, here's the bottleneck here, this is what we have to do something about, or here's where misinformation comes in. This is a good part, it should be emphasized. Which is the way it normally happens when you do it for a manufacturing plant. Okay. We're just, we started out by uh, looking at the minutes and a couple of comments about the minutes. I don't know if it's appropriate to, to add just a little anecdote to the conversation. Mm -hmm. When we talk about um, neighborhood schools, uh, just uh, to give you just a, uh, a fast experience, um, when we talk about the grow out, we really, we really need to make the sixth and seventh, seventh and eighth grade true grow outs. That, that's really important. If you're talking about neighborhood schools and families and knowing children and supporting them, uh, they have to be true grow outs and they're not now. What do you mean grow out uh, instead of just placed? Just placed. Uh, uh, so if you have seventh and eighth, your sixth grades grow out to seventh. They're not placed from all over the city. Well that's the problem. School the, four experience, yeah, right? and school seventeen, and every, and, and and the others. The, the other piece of that is um, uh, and this this needs to be formalized because if you have three sections in the seventh and eighth grade, like I did uh, for those two years, what you have mathematically is about nine or ten itinerant teachers, teachers that come in teach one or two classes, disappear, can't get them in the same room to have a meeting, they have no ownership, and it's Thanksgiving before you know that I know their names. But mathematically, if you reduce that grow out, seventh and eighth, to two sections, you have zero um, itinerants, all full-time teachers. It's real simple to do. Uh, in a district our size, we can do it. And it would absolutely transform the um, the culture and the stability in the stuff in there. That's a really important. Um, and just to piggyback on that, you know, uh, my kids all went to school twelve, and the school twelve parents that were promised a lot for school twelve to grow out to seven and eight and found out a lot of that was taken away or wasn't funded properly have been trying to fight to get teachers there that are there for more than one or two periods because you can't build relationships. Yeah. It's, 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 That's exactly the problem. Yeah, it becomes a yeah, exactly. opportunity to go back on their flex period and meet with 
their math teacher with their a subject that they're struggling in and it becomes a debacle right yes right and then with scarce resources um, you know, the superintendent can't make a decision to simply go with the parents who are the loudest necessarily I mean we're trying to make equitable decisions across right. the district and so that would make sense to you know reduce the number of strands and, and move towards full-time rather than all these because that it's a critical issue across yeah, the district and with my yeah. teachers in the middle school which is mm -hmm. a disaster well, and it's just it's just it's it's setting up for failure it is too which i don't understand i mean if you're not going to fund it then just don't do it rather than you know fund it at 0.2 or 0.3 and then wonder why the kids are are dropping out at seventh eighth grade and aren't attending school you know, just don't do it. If you're not going to fund it properly, then don't do it. Okay. Um, any more comments about the minutes? Um, I had a question. Do we have someone that we're going to be talking to about transportation? Or what's, you know, like we the can invite process? people in if, they're, if, if the group wants to have specific experts come in or, you know, representatives from the district, we can definitely request folks to come in. Um, so maybe that's something you want to put on the table. Well, is it, I guess my question, is it a big, big mess? From our past discussions, I've heard, like, that transportation is a lot to deal with. And I guess I just don't understand the whole transportation process and how huge it is and what a transition it would take for us to bus more to neighborhood schools. Uh, I guess I'd need a better understanding of that transportation. Well, Willa can probably speak a lot to that. I mean, I can just say in a nutshell that um, there's, a, there's reimbursement from the state for transportation of, of kids um, if they have to go a mile and a half. But if they're going within a mile and a half, we don't get trans we don't get reimbursement. So a lot of times families will uh, maybe the neighborhood is dangerous or they don't want their five year old walking by themselves or you know whatever it is. And so to get that assurance, they might send a kid across the city. So we have a lot because of the reimbursement problem. That's what really it is. Okay. we're we're getting um, choice <laughs> patterns. And the schools are no better across the town than they are close to Rand. So it's purely a transportation reimbursement problem. Right. And we're working on that. Could okay. we ask the question, or I suggest that we formally ask transportation to do a cost analysis that compares the total sum and also the total sum for transportation, what it currently is versus a more neighborhood zone, and then have a separate comparison of how much of that would be reimbursed by the state with a new pattern and how much would fall on the shoulders of the district. Because that way if it's a four million, if it's a 14, if it's a 40 million dollar difference that the district would have to pay out of pocket, we need to know. If it's 400,000, I, I think that's a, that's a small sum. I, if it's 40 million, I'd say no way. If it's somewhere in between, let's find out. Self-comparative. Sure. Just such a study was done quite a number of years ago now when we first raised the mm -hmm. question. We first started talking about busing uh, within the mile and a half. And um, uh, this part of when the board discovered that there was an awful lot of cross zone mm -hmm. busing that was taking place, notwithstanding that there's no room in the policy for that. Um, Jerome Underwood mm -hmm. did that study, and he could probably brief us on what it looked like then. And it's within ten years, probably. It wasn't that no, long ago. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah, within. Okay, yeah. I remember it being done. But, yeah. but <coughs> some things changed since then. Namely, Dr. Vargas had changed the pre-K mm. status and basically said anyone who's enrolled in a pre-K in a school has priority over the neighborhood and over sibling preference. The, and, and we don't really know the end result of that. Uh, so we probably need to do 
uh, the study all over again, and it would probably be useful to ask Jerome Underwood to spearhead that because he knows what he did the first time. How do we ask? How do we ask? Uh, so, how can we officially leave this meeting knowing that that request has been made to the people who would do it? We can make an action item on that, one, yeah. right? And is that the same as the Alves report, or is that different? The Michael Alves, Alves report is different. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so maybe yeah, we can that, ask. That's different entirely. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what I can tell you is that School 33 and East High came to us at one of our committee meetings asking. Uh, you know, for our blessings on some kind of a, a, a feeder pattern mm. between the two. And um, the data that they showed us was that 53% of the students lived within the zone for mm -hmm. School 33, which made my head explode. Because that means that 47% of School 33 kids are coming in from outside the zone, not outside the neighborhood, outside the zone. Mm -hmm. And School 33 is right in the smack dab in the center of the Northeast zone. Right. So it's not like you have boundary <coughs> issues. What um, I, this is all anecdotal, but what I would say is because of the Florence Brown pre-K, yeah. the pre-K program by virtue of the UPK legislation says that the parent can choose any UPK anywhere for any reason, closest to daycare, closest to mm -hmm. work, whatever. And once they're enrolled in that pre-K, mm -hmm. that's that. So when Dr. Vargas said anybody who's in pre-K has first dibs on a seat going into kindergarten, essentially did exactly the opposite of what everyone in this room is talking about, which is to get neighborhood kids to go to neighborhood schools. In fact, it went against everything wow. that the committee, that the people who were presenting to us wanted. And yet, when you talk about uh, changing that back to the way the policy states, which is preference for siblings, preference for the neighborhood children, everybody said, but, but there are babies, they're already in our school. You can't have it both ways. Right. And we have to get a waiver or do something with the state nonsense there. Right. I mean, that's that's a conversation that has to happen. Yeah. I think there are other an there are answers. Yeah. But we're not pursuing. I have in my head that the, the difference in the busing costs and it was cheaper when it was neighborhood busing, short distance busing, and everybody went there. It was probably on the order of five to ten million out of a sixty million budget. What I encourage people to practice now is read yesterday's paper on facilities modernization plan and again opposing it or not proposing it and contact him because he's the same block on the busing issue. Right. That's right. So for practice, call now, complain about support for FMP. So we have some political legislative mm -hmm. stuff we need to work on. So I want to circle this back around if I can and just talk about um, how I wanted to structure after the minutes. Um, we have bucket three to present tonight. Um, I also want to um, remind folks that I, uh, if you read the email from Mia, um, we have all of this, I start to get crazy with all these papers and minutes and they're all organized and you know, I try to gather them in one place, but we're now online, there's a link you can see everything that we've done, it's in one place. And if you have any problem finding it, Board Docs is the site where it goes. If you have any trouble, you know, shoot me an email, but you just click, you look for Manage care uh, policy task force business uh, or meeting, and then under um, I think it's agenda, mm -hmm. view agenda, yeah, view it's agenda sort of, sort of like then you can see all of the notes we've had. I think this is our eighth meeting now of minutes, and you can see all of the attachments, the proposals, the maps, everything. We put it all under there, it's in one place. Makes me a little bit more sane. So, um, so and so we'll we'll use the time today for bucket three to present, and um, then I want us to think about either going back around the buckets and sort of come back to questions that people may have, or start moving toward um, 
You want to say what your idea was about having one person from each? Because we want to eventually bring this into one document of suggestions, maybe have representatives from each bucket come together and kind of chat amongst themselves and put together a proposal and then do some drafts and then whole group discussions around you know, how we're going to bring this all together. So that's where I'd like us to be heading eventually. But I don't want to take too much more time about that because that's down the road and bucket three needs to present today. Liz, who's on the board policy committee? Will is the chair. Oh, great. Oh, great. And uh, Jose Cruz and Mary Adams, or is it yourself? Mary, right? Mary. Oh, good. Good. Can I ask a question about what Bill was talking about just before we get started? That You were talking about the feeder patterns for School 33 in East, and you, they were asking for their blessing? They were asking to... Uh, <coughs> You were thinking, you um, here's the deal. So the, 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 the Beacon School idea or the community mm -hmm. school idea, mm -hmm. there are all these definitions and it's a little bit gray about what we mean by community school and we have some wonderful definitions out there like, you know, Ralph has provided some and then the Farish Foundation has some a set of definitions and there's a lot of overlap and so people are trying to uh, go for um, some money, basically, to pull it all together. And there's a there's an interest at School 17 about turning that into community school, and the city's interested in partnering with that. And then there's an interest with 33 and East, which would bring you know elementary and high school together, make a feeder pattern, mm -hmm. and turn it into community. It'd be great to have one in each zone, right? Yeah. So that's that's the conversations that's going on about how do we how do we make things more feeder so it's more stability. Right. I'm just curious about how that interest, because it kind of applies to, I think, what we're talking about here. Like, so if that's an interest at other schools, do you go to the policy meeting? Do you go to, is it teachers at the school? Is it parents? Who, where's the interest? How's because, the, how, where's the discussion? Yeah, where's this, like, where is that coming from? Because if other schools across the district also have similar ideas and plans about how to move forward on all this that we're talking about, it sounds like there's pockets. I'm just curious what the protocol is for. We certainly have other schools that could build momentum for that kind of thing. So is it something official? Is it blessing? Is it policy? Is it, what is it? I can tell you right now, it, it hasn't gone specifically to a committee to be decided yet, but I know that there's, I'm, I'm having like a copy with the superintendent where she's saying, oh, well, Farish is talking with us and I'm in touch with these folks. So people are bouncing ideas mm -hmm. around in the administration, in the administrative cabinet right now. Mm -hmm. But when it gets a little bit more traction, then it probably goes to one of the committees and would that be policy? Probably. Um, or maybe it would be a work session, which would be open to the public as well. So it could take different forms, but it hasn't taken place yet. I know 33 School is in Beechwood, and Beechwood is a connected communities region where connected communities is a national organization that's trying to um, develop strong neighborhoods in urban areas. And so the mayor's office and the Ferris Foundation for the last couple of years, I know because Kyle Crandall is the Beechwood neighborhood president, um, that's why 33, and then East High is right in that, what they call the catchment zone of Beechwood. So that's why 33 and East High School right now, I think, are being discussed. Okay. Yeah. And that has as much to do with uh, these other agencies supporting the idea as it does with going to this board or the mayor's office. Now keep in mind, uh, when they talk to us about this relationship between 33 and East, uh, the, the principal, uh, Sean Nelms of East and uh, Larry Ellison of 33, both described to us how, uh, a vision where this feeder pattern is entirely voluntary, where it's essentially a mechanism by which the two principals can market to parents and encourage this behavior, but they're not asking, actually asking for a change in policy. They, they are just describing a system where they incentivize parents to make this decision. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, so then that would go to your, you know, your marketing group would, would be right in on that, right? So that would be something mm -hmm. we want to be suggesting change-wise. Okay, bucket three. 
I'll leave it to you to make sure it's aiming in the right direction. I can handle that. You got both of us. Uh, I don't know. You want to start it? Uh, the you know I've laid down some of the goals that I think the city schools have. Um, the district is legally and morally obligated to educate all the students who are legally enrolled in the school district and to educate students in a way that is fair for all students. Given the variety of neighborhoods in our school, our schools reside in, the different backgrounds of students, the district and city have the responsi responsibility to provide each school with the level of support they need to give children in all schools an equal opportunity to succeed. So even if it's a poor neighborhood or a rich neighborhood, we need to put into it what, what is needed for the children to succeed. Um, ultimately, schools need to be institutions that strengthen the community and work with the community to educate its children to prepare them for productive lives in our society. And that certainly is, we've kind of fallen down on that. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is, you know, well-intentioned policies that we had for integration and we started busing to try to even out the, the uh, racial distribution and the economic distribution in the schools and the end results is that we've separated kids from their schools and separated parents from their child's schools so it's harder for them to, to uh, be involved. Um, the great, the greatest su success schools need to, for greatest success schools need to morph back into community and local family focus. While the result, return to neighborhood schools is necessary to optimize our schools' positive impact on their students and neighborhoods, it's not sufficient. There are things that. Other, many other things that we've uh, fallen short on. Um, we also need to apply school governance changes that make our schools more responsive to the communities they serve. Applying the concepts described in Ralph Spezio's Building a Successful Urban Educational System through realignment in accountability to the community, this described in his January 2012 paper is a way to do this. Yeah, let me just insert just a second. John's going to go do the, the majority, of, he'll do the numbers that follow. But um, here's my thought on this. The, I've been around a long time. We've had neighborhood schools uh, uh, for a long time. Um, but they're, in my mind, there needs to be a mechanism uh, that formalizes the authentic partnership with the community. So just because you have a neighborhood school doesn't mean that the principal is going to have a mindset that works in, in absolute authentic partnership with the community with shared governance. Uh, so many principals I have seen or experienced uh, say on this side of the mouth that they're trying to support a parent group but privately on this side of their mouth they say I don't need another problem and so if the principal is myoptic mm -hmm. and doesn't realize that their greatest power is the linkage with the community and if they're don't, they don't know how to do that or if they're too insecure to do that then we're going to have schools they're neighborhood schools, but they're operating in a vacuum again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in in my thought is there must be a systemic infrastructure that literally um, forces the the principal to act as one of the co-chairs with the community co-chair in uh, uh, shared governance and, and, the, and the, um, the agenda for each of those meetings 
will be the expectations that the community has for that school. So you're fulfilling those expectations or not. Mm -hmm. And and I would just say um, just one thing as an example. Uh, and this would be a dream for a principal. For example, let me just take the role of the principal again. So John's the co-chair with me uh, for School 99. He's the head of the Neighborhood Association. I'm the principal of School 99. So we're going through the expectations. One of those expectations is attendance. So as the principal, I say, you know, we're having trouble with that. We've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. And I have to tell, I have to report to you, we're having some difficulty but stabilizing and increasing our attendance. So John says, well, let's all talk about that. So another community member says, well, you know, maybe we can get street captains to help out. You see where I'm going with this? So the, the school problem now becomes our school community problem and it's owned by everyone so that what I have done as a school leader is multiply ex potentially uh, the resources I have for working within the school. And how do you see is the best way to get principals to, to okay. embrace this shared okay, that, okay, so that's perfect. So, so here's my thought again. And, and John and I spent um, some time over coffee with this, but here's my thought. So I, I, I wrote that paper, but I'm not naive. It, we, we probably, if we get, if we work with the city of Rochester uh, and, and identify school catchment areas or school mm -hmm. cluster catchment areas, I mean, it, it would be a debacle if we did a school catchment area and cut his community uh, neighborhood association in half. <laughs> it would be absolute debacle. So we, so we really have to have expertise in drawing those. The city is expert in that. Okay, they know all the leaders. They, they for, um, and they they have, they live this. They live that. Okay. If we were only to do school catchment areas or school cluster catchment areas, and the logistics for Transportation, that is a big deal. And you have uh, council members there too. Alone, right, okay. Just that, alone, okay. Now, to put the, the triangle on its head, okay, my thought is to do, is to take a look at your principles and say, all right, who basically is operating with a, um, a shared governance and authentic partnership with the community. Identify a couple of schools. Maybe my good friend Larry Ellison at, at 33. I told Larry, you're doing it anyway, so let's formalize it, okay? And Katarina, who took over for me at 17, she's doing a wonderful job. So maybe that's two, okay? Now as a superintendent, I would give support to that. And John's gonna talk about how it can unfold. <coughs> Dinner meetings with the community, I mean, just a, a a real changing of the culture, multifaceted from every angle, not just the district, the district in partnership with the city. Okay, so there's a lot of things that can be done with those two schools. But now you've got two uh, rubrics. You have you have um, the, the superintendent now can have um, two schools that are, are exemplars. From those two schools, you now replicate. You take, for example, if I was superintendent, I'd say, you know what, I have three principals that have the, the potential to do exactly what you're doing, Larry. I'm gonna have those principals do an internship with you, okay? And, and you're gonna help replicate. Uh, so we have not just two schools in the district doing this, we have six or seven or eight schools at, after one. It was similar to um, that was done, I think, in Milwaukee with the 1990-90 schools. You start with one or two, next year you have uh, six, next year you have. Okay. So what I'm hearing are strategic goals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In this area for the district. And I just because this is something as a parent that I wish was done, is that uh, there is a position of zone chief 
which is between principals and the superintendent, uh, the assistant superintendent. <clears throat> I'm not sure how critical that title is, but it, the zone chiefs do not interact with parent groups in a way that I've found to be productive. And that to me it should be that the expectation of principals is that you are gonna meet these objectives, but right now the way that principals, you know, the zone chiefs check the boxes is unclear to me. I think zone chiefs should be meeting with parents semi-annually, parent groups or the community groups like you say, that, that they should be the ones that confirm to the zone chief that a principal is doing their job. Yeah, no, no. I, I, so and, it's, that, and it's not, it's not, it's not a gotcha. No, it's no, not a like, we're no, gonna hide not, from you, no, and then not. at the end, we're gonna interview the parents. No, that, Day one, this is what we expect. That, that alludes to what I wrote in the, my paper, and that is um, it, it, uh, moving, I think the, the major thing is getting uh, parents to understand that the, the, um, the, the transportation for their children going to and from school is a safe one, okay? And, and, the, uh, and that's the neighborhood school and going back to that. Mm -hmm. is, once that dust settles, once that sand settles a little bit, um, I think uh, the superintendent and board, if they embrace uh, the shared governance and those things that, you know, bringing the unions, bringing everyth everyone in, um, uh, y you do a couple of, of pilots. At the same time, discussion needs to be, hell, talk, serious discussion needs to be done, and this alludes to your point, is uh, the flattening of central office, decentralization. Let, let, let me give you a fast story, I won't, I won't make it long. When I was a, a, a training, a, a graduate student, training for administration, we went on a field trip. It was years and years and years ago. Five of us in the minivan, and as we went, to visit Livonia, it's a rural area. I'm a, I'm an urban teacher, and I'm saying to myself, you know, what are we doing Livonia for? Okay, so the the professor gave us a, a a map of the school district, and I said to this professor, I don't see where's central office here. I don't see central office here. He said, Ralph, there is no central office here. I said, well. Oh, full of, I was younger. <laughs> uh, I said, well, where's the reading director then? He says, Ralph, the reading director is in the primary wing of the elementary school so that when he or she walks out of their office, they see the direct results of their policy. My jaw hit the top of my shoes. I never forgot that. I never forgot that. So, so let me just say one more thing regarding that. I, my son is a lieutenant in the New York State Police. He said, Dad, there is a major in New York City, uh, in the Long Island, that requires his captains uh, four times a year to do all the different platoon times in the squad car. I said, yeah? He says, yes, because that major recognizes that no matter how capable or intelligent or, or skillful his captains are. When you become a captain, you live in a bubble. And when you make decisions in a bubble, you may or may not be making decisions as to how it applies to where the rubber hits the road. So this major says, I want accurate, my, the lives of my um, troopers depend on the decisions made by command. And I want my commanders to have a, a, a good understanding of how this decision, a uh, foundation for these decisions. The captains ride in the patrol cars, and they are they're tied directly into how things are changing. No matter how skillful central office people are, they live in an adult agenda. They need to, they need they need to be where um, the school, the teachers interact with the children and parents. So the flattening of central office, I think, is concurrent with this transition here and the alignment of, of accountability directly into the community. And I can keep going beyond that. <clears throat> the school board members and, and the city of Rochester and so on. Sure. Oh, <clears throat> well, I had, I put together some questions based upon your bucket report and, you know, listening, sitting here in this choice meeting, it just seems really 
hard to be able to deem policy that's going to be applicable to everybody concerned. You know, like we just said, the bubble being able to reach the everybody. So um, I was wondering, you know, the question is, and this is basically to parents, um, when you consider where to enroll your children, do you take into consideration your students' social network in addition, in, in addition to the broadening their social perspective and, and academic ca capabilities? I mean, do you think that the student social network can affect their academics? So I'm saying this so that, to me, I'm talking about the way the parents get involved with making neighborhood schools by using their how their students, you know, connect with one another. Because it just sounds to me, these policies, they all sound like they would work. You know, they sound like they, they, they're great policy. But how do I get this guy's, you know, these sixth grader parents to want to, they weren't in here listening to these great policies. These are great, this is great stuff you guys are coming up with. But unless they're, you know, what makes them want to do this to their school? And, and it sounds to me like, you know, you watch all the models that are going on like for like for um, uh, major corporations and that part of the thing that they do is say how can our people work together the constituency how can they blend you can't have a great team if they all suck no matter how much money you throw at the, this team so you got to get these constituents to kind of gel first don't you it's your just to clarify yeah um, more so the broader transition to a neighborhood policy, w how that would impact, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth graders, not so much the four-year-olds who are choosing, right? So you're, is your, yeah, it would it's taking more sort of that, that, that transition period and the kids who've been going to the same schools for three years, maybe out of their zone. Is well, that who you're kind of advocating for? I'm, I'm advocating for just a, a change in philosophy where we are, we're going to at least consider the students um, social abilities, you know, their network, when we choose a school. So it's not just these great, fantastic policies that really don't mean hell of beans to some of the other people. But maybe little Johnny and Mary and, and Bobby and Sue's, you know, can they get along so that they won't fight now that the school is safer because they're not going to fight each other. Now the school is safer. You know, all of a sudden, maybe with after school, instead of just, you know, playing video games, maybe they help each other do homework. That kind of thing, you know, and the parents are the ones that guide that, that kind of thing, where they're helping each other do homework, you know, parents are encouraging that. Mm -hmm. They're helping each other do homework, you know, they're making sure they get along so they don't actually fight. Now we're safer. You know, uh, the Army often recruits using a battle buddy philosophy. You know, you, two folks from the same high school join at the same time, they're guaranteed to mm -hmm you know, go through basic and AIT together if that's what they want. So your model isn't, the model you're describing isn't too far-fetched. It, I would love to see a system where we, uh, we offer to parents, if you want that, the, that other kid in your class to go to the same school and, and that other kid's parents want the two kids together, we ought to be able to bless that and, and, and guarantee that. Um, what I wanted to say about uh, Paul's uh, remarks about uh, Zone Chief and Oversight is, you know, that, that's in the policy right now. It's called the, school, the Zone Improvement Teams and they should be made up. They should be headed by the Zone Chief. They should be made up of the community leaders in their zone. Um, so the you know in, th in theory, in theory that should be happening, <laughs> but when when we have the superintendents and as we have in the past that really don't care whether this policy is implemented with fidelity, that you don't get you don't get this product. I, right. When, zone chiefs who don't. I mean, to me, that's yeah. if I were a zone chief, that would be a slam dunk. Well, when Van became the board president, he wanted or came onto the board. He wanted to see those zones reconst zone improvement teams reconstituted, and we tried it. And every zone improvement team met once. Maybe one of them met twice, but you couldn't get the zone chiefs to maintain their commitment to it. Right. The other thing I wanted to say, really quickly, is. The zones that we have were built around the city's 10 uh, uh, NBN 
sectors. What happened? The city eliminated their 10 sectors. So um, our hope was that by building them around those sector boundaries, mm -hmm. we would be uh, zeroing in on a kind of stability that, the, that the, sti the city's systems would bring to bear. Unfortunately, uh, I think what the lesson we learned there is that we can't count on other systems to be any more stable than our systems, <laughs> uh, as much as we would like to and as much as we strive to. But one thing that we can do, and I just want to put this out, I know everybody's um, you know, curious about the superintendent search and everything, but we're aware this is a problem. We're aware that the organizational chart of the district needs work. Mm -hmm. We're looking at this. Mm -hmm. You know, the next person who comes into this job, there's going to be some major restructuring about how people talk to each other, getting rid of extra layers so that we can streamline things. That's that's one of our biggest concerns. Mm, good. You know, as so we're looking for mm. leaders. Just want to put <coughs> I, I, I just before John uh, goes forward, I think um, an, an important point that we, I think we all know, but I think it's important to talk about. And, and, and um, so in the 90s, and please forgive me, I, I, I've experienced it both ways. And I keep referring to my experiences, but the experiences from the 90s, uh, especially after we solidified the the um, the systems in place were joyful, and so when we, for the for the most part, school-based planning teams don't work, okay, and and um, but we did the best with what we could do in the 90s because we had a neighborhood school. I knew every every family in that catchment area, and we when we had uh, planning team meetings. The two parents say these are two parents. They would represent that, but these are just two parents. But we had a mechanism for these two parents to survey their constituents. That's powerful. So, so, and and the teachers had uh, uh, surveyed their constituents. Why not the parents? Okay, so. Especially with social media, social media now, it's a lot easier for the 52 school PTO to do so when exactly I came, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, Paul. So when I came back and discovered that less than 100 kids were from my neighborhood, and then uh, over 600 kids were were from the literally the east side of the city, many parents not even knowing where, where the school was, 17. Um, it's really difficult. To, to do to do that those types of things, but he, here's generally what happens I, when I put myself into the shoes of a parent. So I'm working one or two jobs, I'm uh, uh, and I'm tired, and I go home, and after dinner I sit on the couch and I'm exhausted. But yet I'm the school-based planning team parent, so I need to get up off the couch and go. But if I'm being talked to condescendingly, if I'm feel sense that I, I'm just a token. If I feel that the principal is being pressured by central office and is jamming this stuff down my throat, if, if I feel that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go again <laughs> because that's hurtful. I don't like to be hurt. That's painful. I don't like to experience pain. So I'm going to stay home. Okay? And th that's what's happening over and over and over again. The model is faulty. On paper, it looks great. But in, in application, especially um, uh, uh, when, when, when things are, uh, need to be decided on an urgent basis and so on and so forth, um, I think we can do better. Okay? And if, for example, the, the example I gave you about attendance, so when the community finds out that they actually have teeth and they actually are part of the solutions of the school. And the principal is saying, I need your help, let's work together and link arms. I'm gonna tell you something. I, I would jump off that couch and get to that meeting because I know my time will be well spent. And I know that I will be respected as an equal partner in the decision making. I mean, that's just human nature. That's human nature. And I think we're, many times we overlook it. 
So I built that into the white paper. But we can't do it overnight. This is a whole evolution of, of systemic change that has to happen with a focused, uh, deliberate, methodical, uh, and you said it, uh, Liz, um, uh, goals and, and uh, strategic. strategic goals. But it needs to be supported along with policy and a placement office that works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because that's where we fell down, in my opinion, over the last 12 or 15 years. It, it has, any, any, it has to be monitored because it it, you can't have policy and, then, and just trust it's going to be implemented. It's going to be distorted. So there has to be some mechanism. You're not going to... Don't confuse monitoring with micromanaging. Okay, we're in a micromanaging mode. That's not good. That's not healthy. Okay, um, the, the, the experienced, effective principals know how to make the waters part. I made the waters part in the '90s, but when I came back, it's a whole different atmosphere here. Okay, cuts out. So you, you monitor policy, yeah. but you don't micromanage. And I think whatever we come up with, it has to be simple enough that it can be easily monitored with basic data year over year. And if we can't come up with something that we can measure easily, we know what's gonna happen regardless of who the board and who the superintendent might be. So I would also, I think that whatever fix we come up with, it has to be not, not easy. I was told I teach physics. I say physics is the simplest science, it's not the easiest. And I think we have to take the same approach here. It's gotta be simple, doesn't necessarily have to be easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think business along the same lines has been doing for years. Mm -hmm. Assess, verify, do it, do it over again. But you need to close the loop with the feedback to make sure you've made gains. Because if you can't spot specify that it was changed, it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. Yeah, that's right. So you need something we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if we go through some of the uh, step by step ideas here this may be you know will spur some ideas of some of the things we need to do shifting the alignment and accountability of the schools to the community will require convincing people it will happen and will and we'll need and they will need retraining first we need to convince everyone it'll happen the district has made so many poorly thought out changes and flip-flops most of the people will greet the news with skepticism. Um, anybody who's on this committee and goes and talks to their friends and says we're going to make big changes has probably run into a few, yeah, I've heard that before. Um, the fact that it's happening just as the superintendent is being brought in is going to hurt credibility also because everybody expects the new superintendent's going to come in and they're going to bring in change and it's not necessarily going to be viewed as bottom-up change and I think it really we really need to work on getting people drawn into it and feel like they're part of what's happening uh, not just top-down type imposition of this yes. so be more listening to people engaging with people making it more of a positive experience when we are with them making sure that it's inclusive and instead of exclusive and then even if they do a little part, it's valued. Mm -hmm. I think that would make it grow more so that everybody felt like they were a central member to this. Even if it's just bringing in the drinks and refreshments for the meeting, it's something that makes everyone feel like they, they belong, you know? I also want to know, is there a possibility, like, for parents or um, even for some central office staff to do online training where if they're not accustomed to these things that they don't know, they can go online and learn how to listen better, learn how to engage people better, learn to brush up on their skills. If they're not the best parents, they can learn on an online course, which they could do when they're ready on their time, how to be a better parent, how to do that. Maybe we could help them to define that. And then for Central and all these other places to have the same format. If they're on the same format, they're doing the same policy, doing the same thing, then everything makes is the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we we need to make sure that we we're informing people of what's happening. You know, they mm -hmm. the um, the news media needs to be brought into this, and they have a lot to offer. I mean, you you talk to some of the, 
of these folks and they've been following these beats for years and they've seen all sorts of things tried and flopped and they'll probably be more than happy to give their input into it and if they've got some good ideas we can implement you get buy-in by getting them involved in implementing those things another way to advertise is libraries and i didn't mm -hmm. see that that i think it's really oh, important yeah. that libraries be given more of a role in educating our children because they're the after school and they're in the neighborhoods so with that I, there was a conference last week at the library l LRNG, which is an, a new initiative coming to the city that might fall in line with the, the topics here discussed here. Yes. And it's just a new way of learning. Um, what it says here, education is central to our uh, redirecting education uh, for the connected age, you can't see. Join the movement to make learning more powerful and relevant, relevant uh, to uh, all concerned. And so all it does is just talk about how we learn in all different ways, and a lot of things that we do can be learning, and we can get credited for that. So, for instance, I think they talked about things like people who like music. Well, you know, music has is connected to math. It's connected to a way to learn, and so you can get accredited for that. You know, people like me who like working on cars or whatever, you can learn how to do it correctly, and you can get accredited for that. So, I think maybe that initiative might help here. You know, in this project. Huh? Is that Amon's project? Do you know Amon? This is uh, this is kind of a national thing. It started in Chicago, and uh, the person who came and talked was from California, mm -hmm. and so we're the eight the eighth city being picked mm -hmm. to uh, spearhead this initiative. And so this is just a brand new thing. I don't know a whole lot about it, but it sounds very intriguing uh, to me. Uh, citizens or students can earn uh, badges. It is Amon's work. Okay. okay. He's in he's in Central. Great. He's, been, he's actually traveled up to Chicago to okay. figure yeah. out what they were doing. And so it's going to be connected yeah. to what they want to do is connected to universities and connected to um, employers so that these yeah. badges mean something. That is an awesome Fantastic. community. And, and that connects you to the libraries right away. Yeah. Well, another thing that would, could be done actually is, um, you know, along the ideas of the community school, or the Beacon Schools is, is um, after school hours, places for parents to come in and maybe how the library could be involved in that. So they do really become the centers and that would be a way to promote community badgering, or right. parent learning, all sorts of things. Yeah, I've been involved a lot with School 44 and I know Epony has been involved with that also. And, you know, you look at that school and, gee, they've got some extra space. You could have room for, you know, adult learning, places where people can come in and get a seminar on what are we planning and uh, have them be able to go back to their block or whatever and spread the news of what's happening. Because and, and, and I'll be real quick, and John needs to go through the rest of them, but Lizzie brought up a good point, and this is in my, in my mind. So. It, here's what I think. The same thing that I said with neighborhood schools uh, uh, initially, I think, I think can be applied to Beacon School. So let's say I'm a, I'm a Beacon School principal, let's pretend, okay? So now on paper, I have all these partnerships, I have all these things going on, I have, the, 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 I have after school, the, but I really am <coughs> not connecting with the parents and the residents of this community on an authentic, real basis. It really looks good. It looks good. Oh my God, he's got all these partnerships. But there is no mechanism for me to, unless I understand it, unless I, I want to do it and realize the importance of doing it, uh, shared governance. The shared governance piece, if it's done right, brings the the neighbors the residents and the and the parents in to the family of the school it, it you have a school community it, it's like Thomas Sergio Giovanni you, it, you have the school community and then you you take that school community and you expand it to the whole neighborhood as a, as a learning community that's that's the, that's what we're talking about here so if, if there is no infrastructure to do that, 
it, it will happen only by an accident. True. Yeah. I'm sorry, John. Leadership, yeah. So, um, number two there was the uh, getting the city, Rochester City School District, to closely work with print, radio, TV, news organizations to ensure a transparent, non-threatening, and well-publicized transition. Uh, we've got an awful lot of opportunities with uh, social media to be able to spread information around. One of the reasons that I try to uh, video a lot of the meetings we've had is put it up and, you know, most people won't sit around and listen to a, an hour and a half meeting, but if they have a real fascination for it or if they're thinking in a different way, they'll look through it just to be able to find the fault and maybe that's what we need to do is have people oh this is not working right you know so trying to get a conversation going with people who have energy to do these things is uh, is important um, uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, put together some concise TED talk sort of uh, presentations you know that can be on the city website uh, somebody you know, in, in one uh, group or another on Facebook thinks this is good and they can pass it on to friends they have. Stuff spreads awfully fast if you've got something that's, and the easier it is to follow and listen and get through it in 15, 20 minutes, the better. So let me just be sure I understand what you're saying around the TED Talk. Are you saying like, for instance, this group would be producing a TED Talk? No, well, so People sure who, who are good at, at, at doing it, you know, somebody who can speak well and try to, uh, well, this thing here, if you can, we'll talk about it for three hours, but if it can be reduced to uh, a 15 minute presentation of what we're trying to do, because people need to have a, a clear vision of what we're thinking and also know that they have a, a means for getting some input in if they disagree with something. Maybe what we can do is translate uh, our recommendations from this task force mm -hmm. into a video. With which, like, Ralph Spezia was talking about. And so just, what if we, maybe not today because of time, but if each of us talked about the reasons we're here, we might be able to project our personal, because I'll bet there's 15 different ones that are all connected. We might be able to project those reasonings, you know, to help mm -hmm. us get to these uh, policy applications. Sure, and, and people can identify with those. Yeah, because right. I bet uh, some people can identify with mine. You could probably get a bunch of people identify with yours, and, and if everybody were to do that, uh, I would bet we'd have 75% of the whole community, you know. It's great. It is great. <laughs> um, <coughs> The other thing that we, we need to address somehow in some of the discussions we have with the community is to really in, include uh, some uh, awareness of uh, racial and poverty sensitivity because not everybody's starting from the same viewpoint in, in the city. There are people who have really been isolated in, in a, a very comfortable existence and others are are on the ropes an awful lot. And so we need to get people really understanding what all the things are that pe we need to address as we look at uh, at implementing the changes. Make sure, uh, I've, yeah. see, I've seen well in, very well-intentioned people who talk condescendingly to parents. I mean, they're well-intentioned, but they don't understand, they don't realize that they're doing that. That's my doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and and so um, uh, a lot, some of this is cultural, some of this is uh, 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 um, class, uh, 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 economic class, but um, I think that um, we just have to, uh, if you really understand, I don't care how many college degrees you have, how much money you have, or whatever, you will really never know that child as well as the parent. Never, ever. I don't care if you have five doctorates. So 
you're not going to really make any progress with that child as a teacher unless you partner and build the bridge with the parent. It is absolutely essential. And you can't build that bridge to get the parent's true uh, help uh, if, if, you, if, if you're going to act like a big deal and know all the answers and so on and so forth or, or point your finger uh, to the child's weaknesses all the time. Well, and I think to that point also as far as test force, um, <coughs> teaching at East High, I would not want to teach anywhere else. And I advocate this all the time. I'll send my daughter and my son will be there next year. I think oftentimes we try to be somewhat politically correct in, in how we present things. And I think in many ways we're belittling the communities that have the least economic security. So I'll look at my students and say, I want economic security for you. And they're like, Mr. Conroe, what are you implying? I'm like, I want you to have a middle class lifestyle like I have. And I'm not worried that I'm going to offend anybody because I'm just telling them what I want. And I'm not telling them, I know what's best for you. And I, I think that the task force is not, can't take the approach of, We've all been sitting around this table and some of us have degrees and we've all been educators and we know what's best. So I think you're right. I, I, I think too often in, 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 in the conversation, it's the people who have the power know best. Yeah, or the money. Yes, and I think that what we want to illustrate is every school and every neighborhood should have pride in their community. Done. Not because you're the richest one, or not because you're the poorest. Somebody's got to be richest, someone's got to be poorest, but we should have equal pride. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is it like possible or feasible to just pick a test school and then take like some enrollment mm -hmm. forms and all summer long go door to door in that particular neighborhood and enroll kids right on the spot and just use that as a, like a test school so that some of this these words can begin to become actions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of wondering because it, would that be possible to do that? School four and six did it the first year we had school choice. They went door to door and they recruited every single kindergarten age child and said, "Please come to, to our school, school four and six. Here's what I mean. Here's what happened. I did um, a huge community, community picnic. We had the bounce things and we had the food. Um, we filled the, the playground. I mean, it was it was um, really well attended. Uh, I had I had help from Charles House. They they spread the word. Um, I did the backpack express because I had speakers. I said we're going to go back to a neighborhood school. Everyone's excited. I mean, everyone is really excited. Um, and I said we're going to um, we're going to have the mini buses and. Well, what happened was, I bumped into the reality of central <laughs> office. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and exactly. so what happened yeah. was... And, and, but there it, could be a school right now oh. that they have not yet placed every kindergartner. I have no, I mean, I don't know whether they've... Uh, they've sent out letters. Mm -hmm. well, it may not be something that could be enacted this year, because families may already have been told. So we, we have to think this up. Right. But if not, no, but if not, that's a question. Yeah. Well, well, it's a good, that's a good well, answer. Well, a good yeah, question. Well, thanks, because... So, so, so here's what happened. Um, so that the, the, spite, the excitement spread because many people remembered what it was like in the 90s. So when it came time for enrollment, I mean, either there wasn't any room. So either you say, like they did in Boston, we're going to go back to a neighborhood policy. So we're, next September, we're gonna, or the September after, we're gonna, people, you're going to enroll to your neighborhood school. Um, and these so, are the boundaries. So how, I mean, why wasn't there room? Was it because yeah, it was well, older like, grades what, or because well, they were outside half a mile? Or what, what, what year happened? are you talking about? Uh, 13, I came back uh, uh, 20, uh, 13, um, 2014, 14, 15. So parents would say, I live across the street. I called central office. I'd like my child in your school. And they say, I can't do it. That's because they missed the deadline. Uh, no, they didn't miss the deadlines because I had too many kids in that classroom. You're and not talking about kindergarten. You're talking, talking about K K6. You're talking about voluntary transfer. Oh. Yeah. Mid-grade. Oh. Middle grades. And, and the whole school. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, the parent. Uh, the, and so that really hurt my credibility. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, in other words, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Well, it's not mm -hmm. just that, though. If your school is full, your school is yeah, full. You can't we, kids. One, of, one of the primary tenets that I would argue to my deathbed on about choice is the right to, for a child once placed to continue to the terminal grade. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's one of the things that you know, we talk about here is trying to start start from the bottom up and when there's room in the in the pre-k get the pre-k school from filled up from the neighborhood so go door to door if you have to to get those that's what some in. that's what seventeen is doing now uh, they're, they're built they're building from the primary uh, through the grades and hopefully in a few years that school will be back to a neighborhood school so I think that's what I'm also going to um, identify the time it's about quarter till we do need to wrap this up in like the next five minutes. So um, we'll either take a comment, maybe Ellen or two, and fast forward through this or just you know cut to the quick. So. All right, so what I was thinking is that um, considering that we're supposed to be the community task force, if we took that one trial school and like we worked with it throughout the summer, we found the people to enroll right in the neighborhood in Europe and work with the city school district about getting those kids into that school. And we didn't just start it and then leave them to figure everything out themselves. Like, kept working like throughout until everything got together, until the neighborhood buses got together, until we got the, uh, even if we had to come out there ourselves, I don't know y'all times, but we had to come out ourselves and, and be crossing guards for the kids to get to school until stuff can be enforced, you know. Um, I'm just saying like, if we could just take just start at the bottom with a school mm -hmm. and just totally, you know, revoke oh. it, I guess. And oh. considering we're working with the district, it should be able to, there should be more room to, you know, transfer kids. I mean, of course not all kids should be transferred out, but gotta start somewhere. So, um, the, it, I felt very uncomfortable when you said, um, I uh, want, want you all to be middle class and I would, highly recommend that uh, this team, if it's not aware of it, is Bridges Out of Poverty, is an awesome curriculum and it, it, it shows what happens at the poverty level, what happens at middle class, and what happens at upper class, at, like uh, financially rich. Um, and you, in the lower, the poverty area, you're building relationships. You've got um, you have to build relationships or you can't survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you go to middle class, you let go of some of that. You know, um, it, achievement and uh, getting up there becomes more important often than relationships. And I think sometimes we think at the middle class level we're better or we're in better shape, but I think spiritually we're not, and that there's something going on in people taking care of each other because they have to take care of each other because they're not being taken care of. And I think we need to really understand that. And I know the Open Door Mission is starting to uh, take on that curriculum, Bridges Out of Poverty, and I think Skinny Atlas, I think it is, where they went to uh, that whole community, like the mayor down, is starting to look at Bridges Out of Poverty because it's very, very asset-based. You look at that um, poverty class and, and you pull out of it, you extract all the positive stuff that's there, all the relationship building, all the you know, solid stuff that's there, and not act like, oh, you really want to be here. No, in some cases when you realize what you're leaving behind, you might not want to be. Oh, is that FII? No, but FII is very much in tune with that. It's, Family it's, Independence it's Initiative. It's woman whose workshop that I we spoke went to. to. Yes. And I actually she spoke attached. directly to yes. this. Wonderful. And I touched, about, yeah. Talks about how, for instance, the, the reasons why those relationships exist. Your car yes. breaks down. You yes. better call Uncle Joe. That's right. You better be ready to do something for Uncle Joe, or the next time your That's car right. breaks down, he's not going to come and help you out. And so. you want to tap into that. If you want to build a neighborhood mm -hmm. school, you got to tap into the positive, yeah. 
positiveness Absolutely. of that Absolutely. before Everything's you move move on. Everything's about relationship. I hope I didn't offend you with everything Not at all. Like, no. There's nothing that you said that I wouldn't wholeheartedly endorse. And I think even the title of the book, Bridges Out of Poverty, is right what I'm, that's what I'm telling my kids. Okay. But don't yeah. throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Keep the, yeah. keep the relationships and value uh -huh. the relationships, but understand that you don't have to live you know, hand to mouth. The the other, th you I'm know. I'm gonna actually have to call time because I'm, you know, it's ten no, out. We really we can continue week. this next week. We can do that. We can do that. Complete this, and then I think what I'd like to do is um, start circling back around to the other buckets and kind of move it more towards a full conversation, um, so that we can begin to pull together a yeah. document. One thing I, I wanted to. Uh, one thing I would like to touch base on is. Uh, you know, in number 60, we're talking about having uh, counseling in the schools and in some of these here where we have uh, educators, educators or uh, social service folks in the schools, and some of it also involved with the PTOs. And one of the things that I think is being cut out this year in the district is the, uh, the OASIS program mm -hmm. is being gutted. And uh, here we are trying to put something together where we have a need for that, and we're in the process of destroying it while, while we speak here about what we'd like to do. So we need to be aware that you know having continued uh, uh, adult education is is vital when you're trying to improve things for the kids because nothing is going to be more encouraging for a child to to see their need for continuing their education for the rest of their lives and seeing mom or dad in the process of brushing up on some of the skills they need. And REOC can't take on that capacity. They cannot take... for high school is right. Well, Oasis no, no it's, it, no, it's it's both. We're, Oasis is 18 and up. It, you have to be disenrolled from the school, from, from school to attend Oasis. But the point is that you're giving parents, and these are parents that aren't eligible for some of the REOC programs because REOC makes you have a high school diploma first. And our o OASIS does um, technology, but um, you can also earn your uh, degree, while your high school equivalency while you're doing that. So you're screening out a lot of people who you want to be examples of education in the household. Okay. Mm -hmm. I need to call this to do a close, and let's look at dates for next time, okay? Um, either Tuesday or Thursday of next week. Um, Tuesday's a long day for us next week. Um, do either of those dates work for everyone? Yeah. At 4.30, either Tuesday or Thursday? We'll make it work. Okay, on Tuesday. Okay, so then we better do Thursday if that's okay. June 2nd, wow, June already. June 2nd, 4.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll work still because the public... So the public hearing for the... Um, the code, the of, code conduct of conduct is 6, 6.30, so we're okay. still okay. You guys could stay after and work on the code so, of conduct. So, uh, what, I'm sorry. Um, Liz, what did you identify? June 2nd, uh -huh. Thursday, 4.30. Great. And you'll find a location for us? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's booked, though, for June 2nd. Oh, it is booked? A lot of it is. Okay. I had to book some of the office room. Okay. We'll find something. Okay. Maybe All a right. restaurant. Yeah, maybe a restaurant.